for the playing of the national anthem. Councilmember Stenziano, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome Reverend Tim Ahrens, the Senior Minister of First Congregational Church, back to the podium. Welcome back to Council, Reverend. Good evening and thank you for this opportunity to be with you. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty God, creator of the universe and each one of us, giver of all that is good, all that we have and all that we are, we begin in you and we are embraced and given strength in the power of your spirit. You are gracious and loving and we give you all the glory. On this glorious evening of your creating, we are mindful that your holy scripture declares, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You are compassionate and merciful. You love everyone you have made, and you have made everyone. In you, O Lord, we are one. As we begin tonight, we confess the times and places we have not fully loved you or loved our neighbor. Forgive us, O God, and create a clean heart within us. Help us to love our neighbor, beginning with the newborns and the children and their parents in our growing city. Help us to love our neighbor, the forgotten men and women and children who look to us for help. Help us to love our neighbor, especially our soldiers returning home from war and seeking healing and health. And tonight, we lift up the Tuskegee Airmen and especially Mr. Donald Elder and others who come as a blessing to us. Help us to love our neighbor, and tonight we lift up the men and women affected by city ordinances. As they return from serving time, may they find a way to serve our city, and may they be given a chance in this city because we are gracious and loving of them. For your amazing grace and all your love, we give you thanks. We remember tonight the words of our 44th President, Barack Obama. We are our sisters and brothers keepers. Help us, Lord, to live into his words, into his call for us to be better citizens in a city that needs us to be our best. On these hot summer nights, may we especially be thankful for life in this city and help us to help our neighbors in new ways as we walk the streets together and spend time being neighbors together. Now, as the sun turns to its setting, and we pray a special prayer for the council. Guide your servants on city council, our mayor, Andrew, and all who serve our city in the police, as firefighters, and in the city services. Keep them humble and honest and always hopeful. Remind them now and always to lead as servant leaders, to live in the light of your love and your promises of new life. Send your spirit upon us all. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Is there a second? Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. 
This week's communications received by the City Clerk's Office are listed on the agenda and they'll be published in the City Bulletin. Are there any other communications to be read in the record? Not at this okay. time. How about resolutions from members of Council? Councilmember Elizabeth Brown, Councilmember Mitch Brown, Councilmember Hardin. Thank you, President Klein. Um, if Letha Pugh and, uh, and Reese Nader's parents would uh, approach the podium. Resolution 200-X-2017 to present Letha Pugh of Bake Me Happy with the Reese Nader Memorial Award for Entrepreneurship and Social Change. For those that didn't know Reese, he was a staple of the Columbus community who rallied uh, folks together to start their own small businesses. To carry on the legacy of Reese Nader and recognize entrepreneurs working towards the common good, Columbus City Council established the Reese Nader Memorial Award in Entrepreneurship and Social Change for Social Change. The Reese Nader Memorial Award is presented quarterly to a small business or entrepreneur in our city who is working to improve our neighborhoods, to create jobs, and to boost the quality of life for the people of our city. This, quarter award, this quarter's award is presented to Letha Pugh, co-owner of Bake Me Happy. Letha Pugh received a Kiva microloan from Kiva Columbus, a group that Reese brought to town. This microloan helped her to expand her gluten-free bakery. This quarter, we've also partnered with Alex Traxler uh, and Griffin Hollow Studios, um, another small business in town to uh, present this award. And I would just add that um, Letha certainly lives um, and works in the spirit of Reese. Uh, time and time again, she has stepped up in our community um, into tough conversations and shown her leadership. Her small bakery on the south side of Columbus has become a hub of community engagement. Uh, where conversations and community building happen. Uh, I am um, extremely, extremely grateful for her leadership. I am so appreciative to have um, Reese's parents here again today to continue to support. Uh, and I hope this uh, is just a small piece of honoring uh, Reese's legacy in, in our city. Uh, if there, are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? If not, I would uh, move, uh, move for passage and then uh, turn the, uh, the podium over to uh, Ms. Letha. Brown, Brown, Harden, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Ms. Letha Pugh. Thank you for having me this evening. I'd like to thank my, my wife, Wendy. I, I don't know if they made it in yet. Um, I'd like to thank my mother who uh, had two daughters at the age of 16 and made it very clear to us that uh, we have the chance to have a better life. In the city of Columbus, uh, thank you for your commitment to making the path to owning your own business possible and for honoring the legacy of Reese by investing in your community uh, and making Columbus a Kiva city, uh, a feat that Reese was uh, very proud of. I'm honored to be here tonight receiving this award. I work hard day in, day out and I know that I'm not alone in this journey. Someone somewhere at some time told me that they believed in me and I heard it just enough that I actually began to believe it. I never refuse the opportunity to meet with someone aspiring to start their own business because you never know if your inspiring words are just enough to tilt them in the right direction or connect them to the right person. Reese was one of those people in my life. His enthusiasm, for seeing people succeed was infectious, and I plan to carry that energy forward, one person at a time. I feel fortunate to have had a relationship with Reese. He was one of a kind. And so I humbly accept this award as a reminder that we all need each other, and that success shouldn't always be measured by what you've made, but also by how much you give back. Thank you. Congratulations, uh, Letho.
Thank you, Council President. I have just one, one more announcement. Tomorrow at 6 p.m., I'm hosting a public service roundtable. Um, this is a small, uh, intimate gathering where residents can talk uh, about re transportation and infrastructure with experts about anything from potholes to the future of transportation in Columbus. Uh, this is tomorrow night from 6 to 7.30 p.m. at the Clintonville Community Center at 3923 North High Street. Um, hope to see you there. That's all. Thank you, Council President. Councilor Mish Brown. I do have one acknowledgement that I'd like to present this evening. Uh, may I please have Mr. Donald Elder and Mrs. Faye Elder please approach the podium. Tonight I would like to present to you with this, specific, this particular certificate. It reads as follows. Donald E. Elder of Columbus is a documented original Tuskegee Airman. He served as the crew chief of the P-47 aircraft with the 99th Fighter Squadron during World War II. The 99th Squadron coined the Red Tails because of the distinctive markings on their aircraft. They were the United States' first black Air Corps unit. Before 1940, African Americans were barred from flying in the military. However, with pressure from civil rights advocates uh, at the time, including First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, the Army Air Corps developed the Tuskegee Experience, which trained African Americans to fly and maintain combat aircraft. They received the Distinguished Unit Citation for their performance in Sicily during the North African Campaign. Upon completing his military service, Don returned to Columbus, Ohio, where he worked at North American Rockwell, retiring after 33 years of service. Don has devoted his life to the improvement of civil rights and fair employment practices. He has served as the Deputy Director of the Ohio Department of Aging, Manager of Diversity with Bell Helicopter Textron Division, and the founding president of the Central Ohio Minority Affairs Representative. He is a longtime active member of the National Urban League, National Association of Answering the Colored People, the National Alliance of Business, Youth Motivation Task Force, board member of the National Industry Liaison Group, and chairman of the Fort Worth McDonald YWCA Minority Achievers. In March 2007, Don, along with approximately 300 Tuskegee Airmen, was awarded the United States Congressional Gold Medal by President George W. Bush. On behalf of the City of Columbus and my council colleagues, I would like to express my appreciation for Mr. Elder's service to his country and the Columbus community. Mr. Elder, the floor is yours, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you for that recognition. You know, many, many years ago, during my young tender age, I decided to join the Army. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and when I did, I was very fortunate to be assigned uh, to the Red Tails or the Tuskegee Air, what later became the Tuskegee Airmen. And during that time, you know, I don't mind telling you that uh, I've been to many cities around this country. And I don't mind telling you too, when I left here in the 40s and went south as a young man, I cried because I had grown up in Columbus and known Columbus, the city that it was. But in my travels around the country, I've always touted Columbus as being the, an all-American city. You know, they talk about cities being just a place of bricks and mortar and few people gather. It's a city, but not Columbus. Columbus is an all-American city, and I tout it accordingly. I'll never forget when I was, I met my wife who was from Texas, you know, D Dallas, the big, big D, everybody knew about the big D. So on her first flight back here to Columbus, we were flying over the city, getting ready to land, and uh, I had been bragging about Columbus. And she looked out the window. At that time, all you could see was the Levesque Tower or the AIU building. And her little comments <laughs> to me was, this is it? <laughs> so, like I said, Columbus being as it is today, it's a young, vibrant, always re re rejuvenating city. And it's just glad to be, I'm glad to be home. I come home to hope <clears throat> this is where I stay till I leave this great earth. So thank you for the recognition, sir. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for this. Any comments from my colleagues? 
President Pro Tem. Thank you, Councilman Brown. I just want to say thank you for your service. Certainly, um, during the time that you were um, serving our country, it certainly was a time where um, there was a lot going on in terms of discrimination against people of color. And just really do appreciate um, that um, you have served this country, you've served this country admirably, and um, just thank you to you and your wife and to your family for your service to our country, especially at a time where it was a difficult period in our country. But you overcame that and you have uh, just, um, just a testament just to who you are standing here today. So thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. Again, on behalf of the City of Columbus and my colleagues, a true acknowledgement of you being an ambassador of the City of Columbus and the country. Thank you very, very much for your service, sir. If I might just put in a plug, you know, our theme is to keep the legend alive. And if anybody's interested in joining with those who want to keep the legend alive, you can go on your computer and go to ohiomemorialchapter.org and learn a little bit about the Tuskegee Airmen, and you can join the chapter to keep. There's only two of us left in Columbus, so. I'm aware. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank Councilmember Page, Councilmember Stenziano, President Pro Tem. I have a resolution this evening, and I'm going to ask Linda and Ray Hoytgers to come to the podium, please. And this is resolution 0203X-2017, and it's to declare, I know it's not here yet, but we're prepared since we'll have a break, to declare September as a National Prostate Cancer Awareness Month in the City of Columbus. And where September was first designated National Prostate Health Month by the American Federation for Urological Disease in 1999, where prostate cancer constitutes 19% of all cancer diagnoses and 8% of cancer deaths. And whereas in Ohio, an estimated 8,540 new cases of prostate cancer and an estimated 1,020 deaths will occur by the end of 2017. And whereas men with relatives, fam fathers, brothers, and sons who have a history of prostate cancer are twice as likely to develop this disease. And whereas veterans are 1.5 times more likely to get prostate cancer, whereas prostate cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in American men and the third leading cause of death behind lung and colon cancer. And whereas this year approximately 161,360 men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in the United States, this is one, this is one man every 2.3 minutes and roughly 26,730 men will die this year from the disease equating to one man every 20 minutes. Whereas one in eight men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer. African-American men are nearly 1.6 times more likely to develop prostate cancer than a Caucasian man. Moreover, African-American men are also 2.4 times more likely than white men to die from this disease. Whereas education and early detection regarding prostate cancer strategies are critical to saving lives, preserving homes, and protecting families. And whereas men at risk for prostate cancer should be encouraged by the residents of the Safe Columbus to increase their awareness regarding the importance of prostate screenings. Now therefore be it resolved by the Council of the Safe Columbus, this council will does hereby declare September as a National Prostate Cancer Awareness Month in the City of Columbus, and that it be further resolved that the residents of Columbus and Central Ohio encourage men to increase their awareness and enlist men, particularly those with increased risk, to get the testing that they need to limit this disease. And tonight on the council floor, again, I mentioned Linda, Linda and Ray Hoytger, 
Holtgers, and let you have a few moments to share information. Linda, if you want to share, and then Ray, or who wants to start? My journey started in 2009, June 12th, June 19th, 2009. My husband, was, my husband was diagnosed with prostate cancer. I didn't know what was going to go on. Um, I'm the mother of four boys, and it was scary with having him have prostate cancer, but then when the doctor said, your sons can get it, it's like, when, how, there were so many unanswered questions that I still don't have the answers to. Um, but in, in my journey, besides raising awareness and contacting all the mayors in, of Ohio for proclamations, I also created PD the Prostate Crusader. He goes with me everywhere, even to Capitol Hill. And he's my way of raising awareness because people see him. It, he's made out of a walnut. And if you understand, the prostate is the size of a walnut. So there's a significance with this itself. But he's cute and it gets people talking. We've been out to dinner and I've had him sit on tables and people come up. My dad has prostate cancer. My grandfather has prostate cancer. And then we start talking and since doing the proclamations, I've had mayors say, because of you, I have went and had my test. Or because of you, I didn't know that there was Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. So I'm making a difference and trying very hard. But I want to help end prostate cancer. And this is my husband, Ray. <laughs> and he's the reason why um, everything is happening um, but thank you for doing the resolution and I'd like for Columbus to keep it going every year because I keep after all of the mayors and all the cities to keep renewing it each and every year for the ones that have lost their life and don't have the voice anymore and I do want to add one thing <laughs> when we went to Washington DC because we go every year speaking with senators and Congress this year, um, March 1st, as we were leaving Capitol Hill, we were told that the budget for prostate cancer uh, funding went from 80 million to 90 million. And we go every year asking for that increase. So it is increased to 90 million with us helping to go and raise awareness on Capitol Hill. I'm a first generation patient. Uh, my father, my mother's side, nobody had prostate cancer. Um, it's something that is near and dear to my heart right now. Uh, yes, I am a veteran. I can't prove that Agent Orange was affected and get, helped me get to prostate cancer. But as you said, one in five military men uh, have a chance of getting it. Well, I was also a firefighter in the Air Force, and that increased my odds, too. Um, I don't want my sons, my grandsons, to get this, and they're going to have to be tested. It's, it's a simple blood, blood test every year. It's, it's amazing how little men talk about it, and it's amazing when I was diagnosed how little I knew about it. Um, if I'd only known two years earlier, uh, even six months earlier, I might not have had to have surgery. But you see how big a walnut is. My prostate was this size, both hands together. Uh, and the old adage, if there's uh, one rotten apple in the barrel, get it out. That was my only thought. Get it out. Get it out. Get it out. And I had a great surgeon. And right now, eight years, undetectable, so I am in remission. And I, I would encourage every man to get tested on or near your birthday. That way you know that you're doing something. And we need the women to encourage the men. Uh, also, on August 26th, we're having a, a zero prostate 5K run walk and a one mile walk. 
I'm going for the three mile, excuse me, the 5K. 5K sounds so much better than three miles. <laughs> uh, and we do have some, some pens and wrist bracelets for everybody in the council. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And first I need to move for passage. Second. Thank you. And thank you um, both Ray and Linda for coming down and congratulations on being eight years um, cancer free. And again, for the viewing and listening audience, please make sure you're going to have your checkups as you're just listening to Ray's testimony. We were also um, going to have another person come down to speak. Uh, he'll be here in chambers tomorrow when I have the, my hearing at five o'clock, but certainly he said it wasn't an issue to say because John Gregory was coming down to council tonight and he too is a, 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 a prostate cancer survivor. So again, thank you come for coming down and educating us all and um, and continued healthy success. All right, thank you. Thank you. Oh, you have a vote? Oh, oh. Did you vote? Is that And it has been moved and seconded. And clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stanziano, Tyson, President Klein. Resolution adopted. Anything else, President Pro Tem? How about comments from our auditor, the treasurer, Mr. De Pfeiffer? I don't see anyone here from the judiciary. We do have one presentation today from the Greater Hilltop Area Commission. We have the president, Mr. McAllister, President McAllister of the commission. Welcome back to council. I know that uh, you're a regular down here. We appreciate that. The floor is yours, Chairman. Thank you, President Klein, President Pro Tem Tyson, members of council. Thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of the Greater Hilltop Area Commission. It has been almost exactly one year since I first spoke to you as the chairman. At that time, I told you that I intended to see to it that the seat here for the Greater Hilltop Area Commission did not sit empty. Now tell me the truth. How many of you thought to yourselves when I said that, yeah, right, we'll never see him again. I've only missed two council meetings in the past year. One, one I was ill. The other way, I was dealing with a gas leak in my kitchen. I felt that keeping my house from exploding seemed more pressing. Before I begin with what I wanted to share this evening, I wanted to mention something that Mr. Nathaniel Wilkins brought up last week. He protested being appointed as commissioners while these same commissions fail to rep have representation at council meetings. I must say that I agree with him wholeheartedly. While I and Mr. Warner from the Franklinton Area Commission are here each week, most other area commissions are not. I hope you will see our presence here each week as a sign of not just our dedication, but the dedication of our entire commissions. After all, the west side is the best side. Unfortunately, most of the other commissions are not here and not present this evening to accept this challenge. So I'm asking the council to challenge them to send representatives to council meetings on a regular basis. It is only by work, all of us working together that real change will happen. And now on with my report. I've worked hard to establish good working relationships with all of you and each of the different city departments. I have always believed that you can accomplish much more when working with friends than when you can working with anonymous strangers through email. I've had friendly face-to-face -face meetings with most of you, as well as almost every city department director and their staff. Many of these meetings were casual lunch meetings where friendships were being built. I've also tried to include as many city staff as possible in the Greater Hilltop Area Commission meetings. Just to name a few, I would like to thank the Director of Public Safety, Ned Pettis, Director of the Department of Education, Rhonda Johnson and Matt Smido, and the Director of the Department of Neighborhoods, Carla Williams Scott and Toya Johnson, all for coming to speak at our commission meetings. We've also had Assistant City Attorneys Kristen Dickerson and William Sperlaza speak with us several times and work with us. Tony Celebrezzi from the Department of Zoning has come to help us with zoning matters, and in fact, he's scheduled to speak again at our August meeting. The Hilltop has also hosted the dialogue with the directors where we had the opportunity to have an in-depth conversation with Director Shoney and Director Collins. I want to thank members of council for attending our meetings 
especially Mr. Hardin and Ms. Page and Mr. Stinziano. Mr. Stinziano deserves special recognition for coming to address an article from the newspaper that put both the city and the hilltop in a bad light. I appreciate him coming when it would have been much easier to stay away. And for the first time ever, the mayor of the city, city Mayor Ginther, came out to our March meeting specifically to address the Greater Hilltop Area Commission and answer questions from our residents. We appreciate how accessible the entire city staff has been. Also, Ms. Erin Gibbons deserves a special note of recognition. She has been very helpful. Um, oftentimes, when we couldn't get to anyone else, we were able to talk to her. I want to thank you for the many projects that have been completed or started in the last year. The new water tower at Westgate Park is well underway, the new water pumping booster station on Mound Street, the completion of the rebuilding of Hague Avenue, many streets have been resurfaced, the launch of the Mound, Streets, Mound Street and Eakin Road sidewalks project, which was sought after for many years, the completion of the Camp Chase Trail and the opening of the new Wilson Road Park, which was just celebrated last Thursday. These are only to name a few. While something like a new water pumping booster station isn't flashy, and most people won't understand how that will help in the development of the hilltop, we understand that we have to have good infrastructure to, to succeed and bring investors for the long term. With that in mind, we're especially thankful to see the beginning of the West Broad Street streetscaping project. That is something that will be seen by residents and investors alike. It is hard to interest new businesses when there are broken sidewalks, poor lighting, and a general rundown appearance in front of their built buildings. But it will be much easier to bring in small businesses along Broad when these improvements are made. I can't help but think that it will improve the attitudes of the residents when they can be proud of where they live. We have made a good start, but there are still many areas that need improvement. While we'd like to see investors encouraged to turn the Highland West area of Broad Street east of Haig into something resembling the short north, we still have several large vacant buildings, such as the old Coles and Target stores. In fact, the owner of the building of what once housed Target has now been fenced off in the parking area as though it's expected to sit vacant for many years to come. We still have completely undeveloped land directly north and south of the city's premier attraction, the Hollywood Casino. The weeds often grow to be waist high in this area, but this would be a prime investment opportunity for restaurants and hotels. We would not only like to attract visitors from across the region, but encourage them to stay and explore the hilltop. By far the biggest eyesore is the old Westland Mall. The hilltop takes the blame for this, when in fact it sits in Franklin Township. We ask that the city work with the township and investors to do something about this. We would ask that the city offer tax incentives or perhaps pay for the demolition of Westland Mall in exchange for the development of that land and its annexation into the city. The 19th precinct covers a large portion of the hilltop, and it is always near the top of the list of calls for service for our police department. We would like to see many more police officers patrolling our streets. We would also ask that programs like the Summer Initiative be doubled, as well as increase in prostitution stings. Residents who feel there's no point will have much more pride in their own properties when there isn't a crime problem on their street. Ridding the hilltop of these petty crimes, prostitution, and drug dealers is a top priority. As for the Greater Hilltop Area Commission, we have many brand new commissioners, and I am eager to put them to work. All too often, it seems that our committees meet and have good ideas, but then have no idea how to proceed from there. I would like to ask the directors and the staff from each of the city departments to attend our committee meetings on a regular basis, as well as include us in their meetings. We are asking to be involved and are willing to work. I've already talked with the Director of Department of Development, Mr. Shoney, about this, and I know that the Director of Education, Ms. Johnson, is also on board. I'm now asking all directors and staff to meet with our commission's committees on a regular basis. We can't wait for the development plan that is already underway in the Linden area to begin in the hilltop. The Greater, Greater Hilltop Area Commission wants to be included in every step of that. With that in mind, I would like to challenge each member of council to come to our commission meetings at least once throughout the next 12 months. It'd be great to have, have you there as an observer 
but even more, I would like to invite you to come and speak about the committees that you chair and what your plans are for the Hilltop in the near future. I would also enjoy meeting with each of you soon so that we can discuss these plans and get to know each other better. The Hilltop is a proud area, and I believe that with your help and by working together, the best days of the Hilltop are still to come. Thank you for allowing me to speak, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chair McAllister. You certainly, uh, your presence here on Mondays does not go unnoticed. You are a regular. We appreciate your advocacy for uh, not only the city of Columbus, but for the Hilltop. Uh, I don't want to pick on every director, but I do want to kind of pick on Director Shoney, because um, you mentioned um, development in the area, particularly Westland Mall. Director Shoney, do you have uh, any update? Uh, it's kind of a hot and cold subject in the sense that there's some activity, there's not, it's in the township, not in the city. What's the latest that you can provide uh, council with an update? So um, thank you, President Klein. Um, and certainly we're always happy and to work with our friends on the Hilltop and um, you know, we, it's an area that's beginning to see interest from um, uh, developers and, and folks are starting to look at the area. Um, I'll just tell you, Friday we were out with a group, um, happened to finish Friday afternoon and thought it'd be good to stop by one of the businesses, Four String Brewing, it just seemed like a natural place to stop at the end of the day on Friday. Um, and, um, but it is an area that has a lot of potential as it relates to Westland. Um, we are studying it. It's an area that we think holds a lot of promise. Um, as you said, it sits outside the city. The city has an annexation moratorium that runs through the end of the year. Um, that was part of the deal when Hollywood Casino came in. Um, so from that perspective, there hasn't been a lot of activity for the city. We have talked a lot with our um, friends at the township about how to try and move things along. Um, but it will continue to be one of the biggest challenges. I think the biggest update there is the closing of Sears um, in a uh, kind of the backwards way that things like this work sometimes is actually probably a good thing for the entire situation um, because with Sears no longer um, really looking at that property as a retail location, it allows us to move that along. A lot, not a lot of folks realize that um, with large malls, the anchor stores actually own their real estate separately from the mall. And so um, whether it be a Macy's or a Sears where that business is, where that store has closed or is coming close to closing, having something move along there really is important to moving the process forward. Thank you, Director. Any questions or comments for Chair McAllister? Thank you, sir, for your advocacy. Thank you. Are there any requests by members of council for the removal of an ordinance or resolution from the consent action portion of the agenda? <clears throat> Seeing none, may we now have a motion to waive reading of the titles of 30-day legislation by the city clerk. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Harden, Page, Denziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. Uh, clerk, Blevins, will you now read into the record the ordinance numbers of 30-day legislation on tonight's agenda for first reading? Finance Committee Ordinances 1737, 1864, 1895-1896-2017, -1896 Economic Development Committee Ordinance 1917-2017, Public Service and Transportation Committee Resolution 198-X-2017, Technology Committee Ordinances 1976, 1985, 1994, and 2016-2017, Public Utilities Committee Ordinances 1428, 1431, 1542, 1606, 1611, 1680, 1763, 1775, 1799, 1800, 1801, 1805, 1809, 1820, 1831, 1836, 1859, 1872, 1894-2017, Rules and Reference Committee. Ordinance 1970-2017, Zoning Committee, Ordinances 1491, 1768, 1845-1846, 1884-1885, 1929-1932, 1933-1945, 1937-1944, 1946-1947, 1948-1953, 1974-1978, 1979-1980, and 1983-2017. Thank you, Clerk. We do have four first reading speakers. Three are in favor of 1970-2017, and the additional speaker is speaking against 1917-2017. We're going to take the 1970-2017 speakers first, and they are in the order as received. W.D. Smith, please come forward to the podium.
Welcome to Council, Mr. Smith. If you just could state your name, uh, any organizations you represent, your address, and you'll have three minutes. My name is W.D. Smith. I'm a member of the Genesee Avenue Church of Christ at 1889 Genesee Avenue in the Linden area, and we would invite you all to be with us at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. I'm also here uh, representing the Bread Organization in support of the ordinance that Councilmember Brown is putting forth. My nephew has a fantastic work ethic and a brilliant mind, uh, a great mind for mathematics and computers, and he was going to college for computer science when he made a mistake at the age of 18 that landed him in jail. He was convicted, he served his time, and he paid his fine. Today, it is nearly nine years later, and my nephew still finds it nearly impossible to locate any employer who will hire him, much less pay a living wage. The man with the brilliant mind for computers and math is stuck working two jobs as a dishwasher. Now, my nephew lives in a southern Ohio county. However, here in Franklin County, Bread's 40 member congregations represent some 20,000 constituents. These congregations each have members who return from state prison or county jail, work through probation and release, try to reestablish their relationships in themselves in the community, but they cannot find work or a living wage because of their background and record of incarceration. We know every year nearly 11,000 people return to Columbus from the Franklin County Jail alone, 11,000. And we know that when we, the larger society, fail to provide legitimate opportunities of employment for our formerly incarcerated brothers and sisters, then you and I become criminals. We become thieves who rob these returning citizens of hope, who rob these citizens of the ability to provide for the life needs of their family. We rob them of the chance to be a decent and positively contributing tax-paying member of the community. And instead, we relegate them to a life of dependency on handouts or even a life of crime, violence, drugs, and alcoholism. As part of the Bread organization, I and the people you see behind me are here to support this ordinance because it begins the process of changing the culture, of throwing away citizens who have offended our laws even after they have spent time in the criminal justice system and returned to our communities. The Columbus Metropolitan Library recently gave us best practice examples of workforce inclusion. In their major building project, it was proven that when leadership enforces standards of change, real change happens. In short, Bread supports adoption of this ordinance. We appreciate the work of Council Member Elizabeth Brown and her staff. We thank the construction industry, the mayor's office, and the Office of Finance and Development for working with us to find a way to succeed. Bread. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Any questions or comments from Mr. Smith? Thank you for coming to council. Thank you. We certainly want to recognize all the folks from Bread that are here. You're more than welcome to take a seat, but if you'd like to stand, that's fine too. <laughs> um, the next speaker is Ms. Tarr, Wendy Tarr. The next three speakers looks like they're all from, so you're all, like I said, you're more than happy to stand. It's your right to do so, but we certainly recognize your presence, whatever you'd like to do. Ms. Tarr? If you just could state your name, any organizations you represent, your address, and you'll have three Absolutely. minutes. Absolutely. Um, Council President Klein, Council Pro Tim Tyson, and all members of the City Council, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Wendy Tarr. I'm the director of the Vincentian Ohio Action Network, formed by the Society of St. Vincent de Paul uh, here in Columbus. Uh, St. Vincent de Paul is a Catholic organization that uh, works to provide emergency assistance in the community with over 3,000 volunteers and 20 
23 counties in central Ohio. I'm here to speak in support of uh, this bill, this ordinance um, that would create a social responsibility in the city for um, improving access to jobs for those facing disadvantages, specifically to include those with criminal history. As a fair and just society, uh, we have to ensure that we're providing fair chances for all of our citizens, especially those uh, who have been marginalized. I've been working with currently incarcerated and those returning from incarceration um, here in the area for a number of years. And of course, one of the first and most important things that someone needs when they're released, along with basic human needs, is employment, which is essential to reintegration back to the society. Um, you know, I know I have three minutes and I like to advocate for these things because I'm closely connected to a lot of people who are directly impacted. But I have somebody with me. I just want to share my time, uh, Cami, um, just to say a few words. Hello, hi. My name is Cami Colbert of Colbert's Painting and Reconstruction. I am a ex-offender. I started my business in 2006. I um, went to real estate school, medical school, different schools like that. Once I tried to pursue those avenues, I was denied due to my background. So basically, uh, I was forced into uh, starting my own business. So it ended up being a cool thing for me. And I've been doing it for 10 years. And since then, I have been doing training with women and men coming out of prison, along with MICA, another organization that strongly works with that. Um, one of the programs that I would like to see come to come to be again is the program coming into the prison, training the inmates prior to coming home so they have something to look forward to and to build on uh, upon release. To, uh, and I always was told, like, instead of giving a man a fish sandwich, teach him how to fish, he'll feed his family for, for a lifetime. So uh, basically, that's what we want to do. We want to train the people so they can be able to have a career and strongly be a um, good citizen again. Um, I have some other people here with me today, but Kimmy works in construction. And um, I think that, you know, after looking for work over and over, not being able to find something, I think the companies that didn't hire folks like her have missed out. Um, but we really want to see people with skill sets be able to access living wage jobs like this speaker before me. And we're just grateful for the efforts that you're taking here, the leadership of Councilmember Brown and the support here of the council for um, making sure that people are getting back on their feet. So thank you for setting some leadership as a first step towards really improving um, what's going on with our city. Thank you. thank you. Any questions or comments? Yeah, Mr. Stenziano. Really appreciate you sharing your story. Just curious, with the construction, have you not been able to receive any Columbus construction jobs under the current qualification no, no, bid currently, process? No, currently, currently I haven't. Actually, I, I'm part of the lead program that you guys have, MBE, FBE certified. Uh, so those organizations or those things that you have implemented has allowed me to actually gain some um, some good contracts. Actually, I have the Hilliard Library that should be coming up, and that was because of the woman uh, piece that was needed. So I was um, kind of double up, a minority <laughs> and a woman in construction. Any other questions or comments? Thank you for coming to council. And uh, one last thing, I just want to say Councilman Harding, I see him out in the community a lot and just watching uh, a show coming through the, uh, he just really um, spun me into being a part of this and standing up and speaking and trying to be a part of. And I just like to say the works of Harding is not unseen. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diane Banks, Ms. Banks. State your name and the organizations that you're representing today, your address, you'll have three minutes. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Diane Banks. I'm with Raymond Christian Center, and I'm representing Raymond Christian Center and also the Bread Organization. 2100 Agler Road is the congregation I'm from. We are glad to support this ordinance today. 
I want to tell you a little bit about my son, Kendall. He has always been a hard working. When he was a teen, he worked cutting grass in the neighborhood. Then he had a part he had part-time jobs at a car wash and footlocker shoe store. As the oldest son, he never minded working, but when his grandfather and then his father died, he quit high school and began to get involved in illegal activities. The biggest problem was geography where we live. The Argyle neighborhood bordering Linden does not offer, uh, did not offer a lot of good options. He could not see a productive future for himself. But what he did see was a cousin, a respected drug dealer, who was doing very well in providing for his family. So because he did not see a future, because he wanted to provide for himself and his family, and because he was hardworking, he started dealing drugs. After a couple of years, he got caught for possession. He was convicted, he went to jail, he got out. He could not find decent work even after going through a few workforce agencies. He started dealing drugs again, he got caught, he was convicted, he got out. Now he is 35. He has matured, he has served his time, he does not want to be involved in selling drugs again or any illegal activity. He just wants to provide for himself and his family. Yet, even though he has served his sentence, the criminal record is a lifetime sentence. The criminal record makes it virtually impossible to find a job which will support him and his family. Today, Kendall works for a strapping company, Strapping Steel. He obtained this job through a temp agency working as a temp for six months, making $10 an hour. He was hired full time, making 13 an hour, and now he makes 15 an hour. He's been there a year and two months. Just this past weekend, he told me that they had to let a person go and cut back on their hours. Now it's Monday through Thursday and no overtime. Even before he heard this news, he had been looking for a second job. Kendall has been on his own since January of this year. My son and, and all people like him deserve a second chance. When we write off a whole class of people, ex-offenders like my son, it's bad for our community. When you have tens of thousands of people with no hope and no possibility to recover, it's a recipe for disaster. It breeds crime, despair, and rejection. I'm proud to be standing here today together with all bread leaders. Thank you. Thank you for coming to council. President Pro Tem Tyson. Thank you, President Klein. And, and certainly, um, certainly uh, just uh, the legislation that's on first reading, and I certainly know that there's going to be, I'm sure, more discussion about this legislation. But I also just want to share that, um, that this city is very much focused on making sure that individuals that have backgrounds, that we are very much committed to people having second, third and fourth, fourth and even fourth chances. Mm -hmm. And so there are a number of programs that this may settle, this may be helpful, this will be very helpful. But I also just want to share that with just the sheer numbers of individuals who come into this community. I think there are a number of programs that this this council and the mayor have certainly focused on making sure to try to help individuals that have backgrounds. And one program in particular, I also just want to mention that here, is Restoration Academy. And so I'm hopeful that with um, maybe you could provide your information to our staff here to provide you also more information around workforce development for or companies and organizations that work to give individuals a second chance, but also train them to be able to continue to move forward in their lives and to improve their quality of life. So this is a piece of legislation, but there's certainly a lot more that we have been focused on in this city to help individuals. So we'll make sure that please give us your information so we can provide you with that information okay. also. All right. Thank you, and thank you to Councilmember Brown on this piece of legislation. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Reverend Ashe, Kajinga Ashe. He's speaking against 1917-2017. It's in first reading. I believe it's in the Economic Development Committee. Welcome back to council. Giving honor to God. Uh, you speak Hebrew, Yahweh, the living Elohim, to President Klein and to all of you council persons. I'm here just for one specific 
uh, reason, my mother Bobby, today is her 82nd birthday. Happy birthday. She's 82 years old. I came, uh, the Zimmerman Corporation is getting a 75% uh, tenure tax abatement. Uh, it's a big deal. A lot of, there are a lot of big deals that go on in city council, and a lot of them. And I'm concerned right at this point about the small deals. I've had a small deal, uh, um, Mr. Larry Drugan, my contractor, fixed my house up. Um, you know, he hasn't been paid his last 23,000 bucks on his fixing the house up. He's went through some of the council members. I know, Shannon, I gave you a copy of the information. Maybe you can share it with other people. But uh, the small people uh, have been getting the runaround at the Piedmont location. Um, uh, I talked to Mr. Shuni beforehand uh, uh, earlier today, and today he said he's going to try to do his best to make sure that he gets paid this week, uh, 23, 23 grand, um, and also get my electrical fixed. My little kids here, they haven't been able to take baths because the electrical shock from the wires might kill them, uh, and also my 82-year-old mother. So for two months, we've been waiting to get our electrical fixed, which is the last part of the, the housing program that we have been put in. Uh, along with the Lyndon Ledfree. Uh, Yumika, Brown, Yumika Broom does a great job at the Piedmont office, great job. Uh, Erica Hudson, the lead program, she did a great job. But you know, you got like two or three folks that always drag their feet. And uh, I've been trying to get on Mr. Shunity, trying to make them you know, do better. Because there's a long line of people that have ax to grind with uh, the Piedmont people. A long line of people, I could drag them out here and all that, but I'm not, I'm not gonna do that at this point. Uh, all I'm saying at this point, uh, Mr. Shuning has said that he's going to get somebody out there tomorrow, the next day, to work on our electrical uh, portion. He's going to try his best to get this man paid this week. He's going to try his best to get the little people uh, some help, as well as the big people like the Zimmerman Corporation. You know, that's a, that's six point five point two seven six eight eight million dollars. That's a lot of money. So they have a lot of money. We don't have very much money. You know, sometimes we don't have any money. But the whole idea is that I can't fight the Department of Development and fight for all the little people and do all the other things and, 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 and do what I do for the city as well. I'm working with Shannon on a project, uh, I'm with Elizabeth on a project, uh, dealing with uh, autism. Uh, I'm, I wanna, I'm working with uh, uh, Mike <coughs> Confluence-Tenziano on a project dealing with housing and including a, a Councilwoman Page. Uh, I'm working on a, uh, also uh, Councilman Brown is dealing with the uh, autism program as well. So there's a lot of things that I do. We got the Concerned Linden Clergy meeting August 5th. You're all invited. Uh, historical meeting, 170 clergy in the Linden area, north and south. Got signatures from both chairs. So uh, I'm doing a lot. And I can't do all of that and still fight these little battles with the Piedmont people, Dan Rydell and Tim Tilton and, you know, um, uh, Jim Muir. I can't, can't, do, can't do both. I can't do both. So Mr. Shuni has assured me that he will help the little folks as well as these big folks. So therefore, I withdraw my uh, against vote for this particular uh, um, um, piece of legislation, and I want the council to work with him and to make sure that Mr. Shuni does his best to work with us on these little projects as well as the great big projects like the Zimmerman project. And that's all I have at this point, Mr. Klein. Thank you for coming down, uh, Reverend Ashe. Uh, building and zoning services, are you aware of these problems? Is this a development issue or building and zoning services issue? Um, we uh, were made aware of, well, uh, I'm sorry, Council President Klein, uh, President Pro Tem Tyson, uh, members of council. Uh, we were asked uh, by the Department of Development to review the work uh, that was completed at um, uh, 1116 East 16th, I believe is the address. Um, they indicated uh, that they had at the time uh, that, that the work was done, that the Department of Development had concerns that the work was not done in, con in accordance with the uh, contractual specifications of the, uh, the rehab uh, uh, contract. Uh, after reviewing uh, the photos uh, provided by the Department of Development, our chief building official agreed that the work um, as performed did not match the contract specifications and the standard deck drawings that were uh, provided. So the, um, the contractor, as, uh, as far as I'm aware, the contractor indicated that the work could not be done in accordance with the standard drawings because of an existing gas line where the posts and footings were supposed to go. Uh, our chief building official stipulated that if that was the case, we would accept a letter from a state of Ohio licensed architect or engineer attesting to the structural integrity of what was built. Uh, to my knowledge, we have not yet received a letter from a licensed design professional stating that fact. Okay. You do have a letter from the uh, Reverend licensed- Shea, this, uh, Because uh, this is on first reading, we're not gonna yeah, get right. into a back and forth. You but do have a, a 
a package, all of you have a package from the forensic engineer who came out and inspected and, and passed everything. His credentials are impeccable. Okay. My, so you'll see that. my recommendation and request, I should say, to sure. uh, building and zoning services is to work with these individuals to make sure this is rectified in an expedient manner. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, Reverend Shea. Thank you. Thank you, President Klein. Thank you, Council. Yes, and happy birthday. <laughs> Moving on to the consent action portion of the agenda. The following ordinances appear on our agenda as consent actions. Clerk Blevins, will you now read the ordinance numbers of each into the record? Resolution of Expression 201X-2017, Finance Committee, Ordinances 1570, 1630, 1685, 1751, 1798, 1808, 1816, 1834, and 1914 2017-2017, Health and Human Services Committee, Ordinances 1797, 1818, 1871, 1925, 1926, and 2056-2017. Workforce Development Committee, Ordinances 1939-1940-2017. Economic Development Committee, Ordinance 1874-2017. Public Safety Committee, Ordinances 1448, 1718, 1742, 1828, 1851, and 1912-2017. Public Service and Transportation Committee, Resolutions 189X, 193X, 194X-2017, and ordinances 1690, 1813, 1830, 1847, 1852, 1855, 1862, 1867, 1882, 1918, 1935, and 1987-2017. Small and Minority Business Development Committee, Ordinance 1945-2017. Neighborhoods Committee, Ordinance 1913-2017. Recreation and Parks Committee, Ordinances 1557, 1658, 1755, 1873, and 1881 2017. Housing Committee, Ordinances 1711, 1875, 1920, 1921 2017. Technology Committee, Ordinances 1427, 1826, 1848, 1850, 1880, 1907, 1949, 1954. 1966, 1971, and 1975 2017. Public Utilities Committee, Resolution 188X 2017. Ordinances 1590, 1646, 1743, 1747, 1748, 1749, 1767, 1802, 1942, and 1943 2017. Judiciary and Court Administration Committee, Ordinance 1915 2017. And appointments from the mayor's office numbered A0114, 123, 124, 128, 129, 130, 131, 132, 133, 134, 135, 136, 137, 138, 139, 140, and 141 2017. Thank you, clerk. We do have one consent speaker. It's Mr. Nathaniel George Wilkins. Mr. Wilkins, welcome back to council. Mr. Wilkins, please you state your name, your address, any organizations you may be representing today, you'll have three minutes. The Chair of Minnesota Vacant Property in North Linden area. My name is Mr. Lathan George Wilkins, 1612 Arlington Avenue. I am supposed to uh, uh, speaking against this. I uh, didn't realize that the city land bank can hold several properties on uh, Taylor and Belvedere Avenue and Parkway. So I, you know, I did not know that the city land bank can hold several properties. But again, I'm probably against this. I would like to know what's going to be done with those properties that's been hold in the city land bank for an, an emergency. Um, I would just like to have more clarification what's going to be done with all these parcels. Thank you for your time. Director Shoney, if you could follow up or someone from your team follow up with Mr. Wilkins to address his questions. Any other questions or comments about the consent action portion of the agenda? Seeing none, can I get a motion for passage of the consent action portion of the agenda? 
clerk call the roll by voice. Ms. Brown. Yes, with the exception of 1658-2017 and 1755-2017, on which I'm abstaining. Mr. Brown? Yes. Hardin? Yes. Page? Yes, with the exception of 1920-2017, on which I am abstaining. Stinziano? Yes. Tyson? Yes. President Klein? Yes, consent action carries with the notable exceptions, and we'll now proceed with the second reading of 30-day table and emergency legislation. The first committee is finance. It's chaired by the President Pro Tem. President Pro Tem, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Klein. Uh, the next 10 ordinances that I'm going to read are for the upcoming 2017 fall bond sale. And before I get ready to read those ordinances, I'm going to ask Auditor Dorian to say a few words. Mr. Dorian, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh Chair uh, and all council members, you have here 10 ordinances, all uh, authorizing the issuance of bonds for capital improvements. The total of the 10 ordinances is $314,120,000. About 91% of that $314,120,000 was directly voted by the voters of Columbus. They voted very specifically on each of the ordinances, uh, each of the purposes contained in those ordinances. About uh, $28.3 million uh, is being issued under the authority of, uh, of council. Um, great deal of work yet to be done before bonds are issued. These bonds will not be issued until the very, very first week of October. And then I might say that they are all a collaboration between the Department of Finance and Management, Director Joe Lombardi and his colleagues, and uh, my office and colleagues in the City Auditor's Office. There's nothing exotic about this $314 million. They're traditional governmental services, and I recommend the adoption of the ordinances, and we'll keep you posted as, uh, as the work evolves. Thank you, Auditorian. Director Lombardi, any comments? Uh, thank you, President Klein, President Pro Tem Tyson. I would just like to say again that uh, working together with uh, Mr. Dorian's office is always a pleasure, and we always end up at the right place, and uh, everything he said I concur with. Thank you, Director Lombardi. All right, so the first ordinance is 1786-2017. It's to authorize the issuance, issuance of unlimited tax bonds in an amount not to exceed $18,225,000 for public safety and health-related projects. Section 44-1B of the City Charter. I first request to waive second reading. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. Now I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. The next ordinance is 1787-2017 to authorize the issuance of unlimited tax bonds in an amount not to exceed $15,230,000 for the recreation and park-related projects. This is section 44. 44-B of the city, city Charter, and I first have a request to waive second reading. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you, and now move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Ordinance number 788-2017 to authorize the issuance of unlimited tax bonds in an amount not to exceed $120,680,000 for transportation and refuge projects, section 44-1B of the city charter. I first move to request a waive second reading. Second. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. I now have Ordinance 1789-2017 to authorize the issuance of unlimited tax bonds in an amount not to exceed $68,865,000 for sanitary sewer-related projects and Section 
1B of the city charter. I request to waive second reading. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. I move for passage. <laughs> Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. The next ordinance is 1790-2017 to authorize the issuance of unlimited tax bonds in an amount not to exceed $62,820,000 for water, storm, and water and power projects. Uh, section 44-1B of the city charter. I first request to waive second reading. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. I move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. The next is Ordinance 1791-2017 to authorize the issuance of, lim of the limited tax bonds in an amount not to exceed $15,505,000 for economic and community development projects, Section 44-1B of the City Charter. I request to waive second reading. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. Move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you, Ordinance 1792-2017, to authorize the issuance of limited tax bonds in an amount not to exceed $5,900,000 for construction management projects, Section 44-1B of the City Charter. Request to waive second reading. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. Move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Ordinance 1793-2017 to authorize the issuance of limited tax bonds in the amount not to exceed $1,500,000 for fleet management projects, section 44-1B of the city charter. Request to waive second reading. Second. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you, move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. The next ordinance is 1794-2017 to authorize the issuance of limited tax bonds in an amount not to exceed $4,645,000 for information services projects, section 44-1B of the city charter. I request a waive second reading. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. And last but not least for is Ordinance 1795-2017. It is to authorize the issuance of limited tax bonds in an amount not, not to exceed $750,000 for recreation and park-related projects, Section 44-1B of the City Charter. Request to waive second reading. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. And now move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. I have ordinance number 1819-2017 to authorize the financing management director to enter into a contract for the option to purchase refuge collection containers with Red Pacific Company to weigh the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code and to authorize expenditure $1 to establish a contract from the general fund. The Division of Refuge is a sole user and the refuge collection containers are used for residential trash services throughout the city. A director Lombardi, do you want to please share with the viewing and listening audience why we are waiving competitive bidding. Thank you, President Klein, President Pro Tem and Tyson. Uh, the reason why we're waiving competitive bid is that the low bidders were non-responsive, so we had to go back through the bids again. They were all non-responsive, but we had to go back through the bids, and we are going with the second low bid on this one that met most of the criteria. So we're only awarding items one, one B, two, two B, and four which are the containers. We are not awarding the other items, which are parts and pieces for current uh, containers that we have that a uh, sole provider will have to, uh, have to um, provide those for us. So we'll rebid those. Thank you, Director. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. 
Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. Ordinance number 1905-2017 to authorize the finance and manager director to enter into two universal term contracts for the option to purchase office supplies, accessories, and papers with Bulldog Office Products, Inc. and Staples Business Advantage and to authorize the expenditure of $2 to establish the contract from the general fund and to weigh the provisions of the city code related to competitive competitive bidding and to declare an emergency. Office supplies, accessories, and papers are used in all city agencies, and this contract will be approximately for two years, expiring the July 31st of 2019 with one year um, renewal for an additional year. I want to mention that the Bulldog Office Products is a female um, business enterprise, and certainly we all know Staples, but we're excited about the Bulldog for female business enterprise. Director Lombardi, could you please share why we are waiting competitive bidding? Thank you, President Klein, President Pro Tem Tyson, members of council. Um, as, as I've indicated in the past, we are developing the e-catalog uh, system uh, the current code does not allow for us to award item, more than one item to one bidder, um, but we are we are picking and choosing which uh, contracts we think would help us in the uh, e-catalog system, which in turn would help give more opportunities to company, which then again promotes more competition, better pricing, and helps our divisions out as well. So that's what we chose to do here. We chose to award two contracts, and as you indicated, President Pro Tem, uh, Bulldog is a female-owned business, so it was an ability to, to give that opportunity. Um, had we not done this, then most of the low bid would have probably gone to one company. So, um, and, and as we continue to look at this, uh, hopefully someday we can uh, change that process to where we won't have to waive anymore. Thank you, Director. Any questions or comments? Seeing that, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. I have ordinance number 1941-2014 to authorize and direct the city treasurer to enter into a contract for armored car services with Dunbar Armored Inc. to authorize expenditure of $67,800 from various funds within the city to weigh the competitive bidding provisions of the city code and to declare an emergency. The city treasurer and other city agencies require armored car services to pick up and deliver deposits on a daily basis. And so, direct, um, not the director, city treasurer, Deborah Klee, could you please share why we are waiving the competitive bidding? Good evening, President Klein, President Pro Tem Tyson, members of council. The city treasurer's office fully expected to be continuing its current contract with armored car services. However, at the end of May, we learned that our current contractor was unwilling to continue to provide services under the, term, the same terms and conditions. As a consequence, we did informal quotes since we had an August 1st deadline, and uh, it, is, it is for that reason that we're waiving competitive bidding. We didn't have enough time to be able to put a formal bid together. Uh, during the period of this contract, um, we will be working with the purchasing office of the Finance and Management Department to put together an RFP so that we can put it out for formal bid uh, and have a solution um, after March 31st of 2018. I'm um, hoping that you will be supportive of this ordinance. Thanks. Any questions, comments? Saying that, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you, ordinance number, may I, may I now move to Health and Human Services? Thank you. Have ordinance number 1869-2017 is to uh, approve the funding request of Prevent Family Homelessness Collaborative seeking financial assistance to address an emergency human service need pursuant to the Columbus City Code to authorize the Director of Development to execute a grant agreement with the Healthcare Collaborative, Collaborative of Greater Columbus to support a Landlord Property Manager Partnership pilot 
to authorize expenditure of $25,000 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. This legislation is co-sponsored by Council Member Jiza Page. The Prevent Family Homelessness Collaborative emerged from the efforts of public and private sector leadership to prevent homelessness by stabilizing vulnerable children and their families through implementation of a plan that aligns the resources to support self-sufficiency. The collaborative's goal is to reduce family homelessness by 50% by the end of 2021. They, they will work with property participating landlords and property managers to help identify at-risk families and connect families with support services, fulfill legally defined duties as a landlord, use forbearance agreements and mediation services to resolve conflicts, and help connect at-risk families with short-term financial um, assistance programs. The primary measures of success are reduced by the number of evictions filed from the zip codes included in this particular a pilot. The target population will begin focusing on at-risk families with pregnant women and women with infants. Um, there also will be um, the, the historical data to work with these individuals would be the location of evictions from the Franklin County Municipal Court, the location of pregnant women through Columbus Public Health, Franklin County Family and Children and Children uh, first Council and Step 1, and identifying privately owned apartment complexes and locations with high levels of evictions and pregnant women. Those sp specific target areas will be determined by August of 2017. And there are a number of organizations that are um, participating in this pilot. Cardinal Health, City of Columbus, Columbus Urban League, Columbus Mediation Services, Community Properties of Ohio, Community Shelter Board, Connect Realty, Franklin County, Franklin County, Franklin County Job and Family Services, Franklin County Municipal Court, Home Port, Homes on the Hill, Physicians Care Connect, Step One, Seymour Institute, United Way of Central Ohio, and the Columbus Foundation and the YWCA. Council Member Page, do you have comments you'd like to make on this legislation? Thank you, President Pro Tem Tyson. And again, this is another piece of legislation that I'm very excited about. This is we continue to address some of the issues that some of our most vulnerable residents and constituents are facing. So thank you for bringing this forward, and I hope that we pass it. Thank you. Certainly, thank you for the work that you're also doing, especially really around these evictions and certainly your funding of community mediation services. Thank you. Any questions or comments on this legislation? With that, I am move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. And the last ordinance is Ordinance 2011-2017, and it is also um, it is to authorize the appropriation of $10,416 to Columbus Public Health and the Neighborhood Initiative Fund to authorize the Board of Health to enter into contracts with Communic com Engineering and MedPro Ways for the purchase of needle uh, disposal containers and the maintenance of said containers to authorize expenditure of $10,416 to waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code and to declare an emergency. And the waiving of this legislation is due to the um, the med, med pro waste of the uh, doing business as secure for the um, needle dispensers. And with that, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. That's all I have in my committees this evening. Thank you, President Pro Tem. The next committee is Economic Development. It's chaired by Councilmember Elizabeth Brown. The first piece of legislation I'm going to turn over to Acting Chair Stenziano. Thank you, President Klein. Tonight, in Economic Development, bring forward. Ordinance 1731-2017 to authorize and direct the city auditor to transfer an amount not to exceed $1,073,769.10 within the general fund to authorize and direct the city auditor to appropriate and transfer 
$442.28 in cash from the Special Income Tax Fund to the General Fund to authorize and direct the City Auditor to make payments not to exceed a total of $1,073,769.10 in accordance with the Downtown Office Incentive Program for the 17 active DOI projects for which employers have met the requirements of their DOI agreements and thus are eligible to receive their payments for calendar 2016 and 2017 to authorize expenditure not to exceed $1,073,769.10 from the general fund and declare an emergency. Uh, this legislation authorizes the payments to employers who have met the requirements of their uh, downtown office incentive program agreement. For tax year 2016, the City of Columbus had a total of 17 active reporting downtown office incentive projects. The 2017 general fund budget includes funding for these payments, and a transfer equal to 25% of the payments will be transferred from the special income tax fund, which has been factored into the current special income tax analysis and resultant capital capacity. Emergency action is requested so the city can make payment as soon as possible and in accordance with the downtown office incentive program agreements. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Hardin? Yes. Page? Yes. Stinziano? Yes. Tyson? Yes. President Klein? Thank you, President Klein. Um, first, in economic development, we have Ordinance 1732-2017 to authorize and direct the City Auditor to transfer an amount not to exceed $10,647,340.97 within the General Fund to authorize and direct the City Auditor to appropriate and transfer $2,661,835.24 in cash from the Special Income Tax Fund to the General Fund to authorize and direct the City Auditor to make payments not to exceed a total of $10,647,340.97 in accordance with the Jobs Growth Incentive Program for the 25 acting and reporting JGI projects for which employers have met the requirements of their JGI agreements and thus are eligible to receive their payments for 2016. To authorize the expenditure not to exceed uh, $10,647,340.97 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. Uh, the Jobs Growth Incentive Program is one of the tools used by the Department of Development to encourage the creation of new jobs within the city. And this ordinance authorized payment for 25 employers in Columbus. I would like to move for passage by voice vote. Second. Is there a second? Mitch, you second it? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Clerk, call the rule by voice. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Hardin? Yes. Page? Yes. Stinziano? Yes. President Klein? President Pro Tem Tyson? Yes. Ordinance is passed. Great. Thank you. Uh, President Klein, I'd like to do one more of my economic development pieces before zoning. Is that okay? All right. Thank you. <laughs> Um, ordinance 1900-2017. We have two speakers for this. If they could come up as I'm reading the legislation, Matt Hansen and Betsy Pandora. Um, to authorize the director of the Department of Development to enter into contract with Designing Local for completion of the High Street Strategic Public Art Plan. To authorize the expenditure of $81,000 from Northland and other acquisitions fund and to declare an emergency. The High Street Public Art Plan will create a cohesive public art strategy for the Short North Arts District and Southern University District involving the High Street Corridor from Poplar Avenue on the south to 9th Avenue on the north. When completed, the plan will evaluate and recommend ways to integrate art into streetscape amenities, enhance locations for performance art, and identify locations for discrete art installations. Um, Betsy, if you would like to um, say your name and you have three minutes and um, also the organization you're representing. Thank you so very much, Council Member Brown. Good evening, uh, members of Council, Council President Klein, Council President Pro Tem Tyson. Uh, my name is Betsy Pandora, and I'm the Executive Director of the Short North Alliance. The Short North Alliance is a nonprofit organization serving business owners, property owners, and residents of High Street in the Short North Arts District. 
Our mission is to nurture the Short North Arts District as a vibrant, creative, inclusive community and leading arts destination. And we are thrilled that the City of Columbus is considering uh, legislation tonight uh, to enter into a contract with Designing Local to lead a robust public art planning process um, for the High Street Corridor, which includes the Short North Arts District. Art artists and art galleries have played a substantial role in the overall revitalization of the Short North Arts District and its continued success as a creative community and arts destination. The Short North Arts District has evolved into one of the most vibrant spots in Columbus that regularly welcomes over 300 annual visitors to our city and is a showplace to, uh, of our city to the world. Public art plays a substantial role in how our community's experience of the arts, uh, in how our community supports the arts, and in how we market our city and promote economic development in our community. And as an arts district, our community, along with our partners in the university district, who I don't think made it here tonight, um, have made it a priority to explore the many ways in which we can celebrate art and artists on our streets every single day. The High Street Streetscape Improvements Project is the most significant opportun opportunity our neighborhoods have had in recent history for advancing opportunities for public art here in Columbus. And as the 14th largest city in the country and one of the largest of its kind without a public art or cultural plan, this, not, this is not only a monumental opportunity for public art and creative placemaking efforts, uh, here in the district, but is a remarkable moment for our city to plan for the future of arts and culture. I have to thank um, former Mayor Michael B. Coleman for his leadership in creating this executive order, which established the process by which a public art plan like this could occur here in our community, and Mayor Ginther for his continued support of that executive order, along with Director Gallagher and her team in public service, and Director Shoney and his team in development who worked tirelessly to make this unique opportunity a possibility. Thank you all very, very much, uh, Council Member Brown, Council Member Stinziano, and Council President Klein for sponsoring this legislation. And we greatly appreciate Council's support and consideration of making this landmark public art planning moment a possibility for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pandora. I'd also like to just make sure, is Matt Hansen here? Okay, let the record reflect that the second speaker's not here. Thank you. Uh, a request for a proposal I'd like to note for consultant services was released in June and a five-member panel uh, selected designing local out of two eligible submissions for this project. If there are no questions from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Legislation passes uh, according to my iPhone at 633. Uh, so we will take a break and uh, recess regular meeting number 39 and then we'll go to zoning in a couple of minutes when the chair is ready and we'll come back and continue on with economic development can I get a motion to recess regular meeting number 39 is there a second yeah. clerk call the rule Brown Brown Hardin Page Stinziano Tyson President Klein we stand in recess of 39 we'll convene zoning momentarily Present. We're going to call, we're going to call the roll here in a second. We'll make sure that you're here. Regular meeting number forty will now come to order. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading? Of Moved and seconded. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. We'll now go to the zoning committee. Chair Page chairs that committee. All members serve on that committee. Chair Page, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Klein. Before beginning our zoning agenda, I'll briefly explain the rules of council as pertain to speaking before council on zonings and variances. We permit three speakers on each side, three proponents and three opponents, and we ask that they limit their remarks to three minutes on each side, and we provide an opportunity for rebuttal from the applicant. I would like to ask anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against any variance, including staff, to please stand and raise your right hand to be sworn in. I swear or affirm to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. I will. Thank you. Variant 1719-2017 to rezone 831 Hilliard Rome Road 43228 being approximately 35.9 acres on the west side of Hilliard and Rome Road 
approximately 450 feet south of Fisher Road from our rural district to CPD Commercial Plan Development District. The applicant is Thomas O'Neill. The proposed use is a home improvement store and other commercial uses. The city department's recommendation is approval and there is no area commission for this area. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues for staff? Do you have any additional comments from staff? We do have one speaker speaking for this variance is also the applicant, Mr. Tom O'Neill. You may come down and thank you for joining us this evening. If you could give us your address and any organizations that you are representing. Good evening, President Klein, members of the council. I'm Tom O'Neill with Menard Incorporated. 5101 Menard Drive, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, 54703. I'm here on behalf of Menards. We've been working for, uh, with the city staff here some months regarding this particular piece of property and uh, for the purposes of constructing a Menards home improvement store. Uh, we feel with our coverage in the market that we have stores in the former Northland and on the east side on East Broad, this would actually uh, create uh, good coverage for Menards in the city and we would uh, respectfully request you support the rezoning of the property. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Are there any questions or comments from Mr. O'Neill? Thank you so much for coming Thank down. You. I would now like to move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. 1842-2017, to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3332 0.039 R4 residential district, 3332.05 A4 area district lot width requirements, 3332.15 R4 area district requirements, 3332.19 fronting, 3332.26 C2 minimum side yard permitted in 3332.27 rear yard of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 1607 M Wood Avenue, 43212 to permit a single unit dwelling above a garage, a carriage house, on the rear of a lot developed with a single unit dwelling with reduced development standards in the R4 residential district. The applicant is Eric Cliffel. The proposed use is a carriage house on a lot developed with a single unit dwelling. The city department's recommendation is approval. Fifth by Northwest Area Commission's recommendation is approval. Are there any additional comments from staff? Thank you. Um, we do have a speaker speaking against this ordinance, and I would like to give the applicant the opportunity to speak first. Welcome to council again, uh, Mr. Perry. Uh, good evening, President Klein, Zoning Chair Page, and all members of council. My name is Dave Perry. I'm the agent for the applicant for this variance request. The property is owned R4. R4 allows single, two-family, three-family, and four-family uses. This particular property complies with all requirements for a two-family. There is an existing single-family dwelling on the property. Um, by going straight to permits, in other words, without <clears throat> action by council, uh, the property owner could build an addition to the house uh, to make it a two-family. The request is to build a detached unit um, uh, an apartment unit over a new new detached garage. There have been quite a number of these proposals in the 5th by Northwest Area Commission. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Are there any questions? I would now like to ask Ms. Linda Wolf to come to the podium. Ms. Wolf, you have three minutes. If you could let us know any organizations that you are representing, and thank you for coming to council. Thank you, I appreciate it. I, my name is Linda Wolf, and I own the property at 1611 Elmwood Avenue. It's a double duplex. It's right next door to 1607. And just for the record, I'd like to let you know before I begin that I did not receive notification of this until Tuesday the 18th. And apparent, I've talked with Bruce McKinnon, I believe his name is, with the Fifth North Council, and he said that sometimes that happens. I should have received information on it before that, or else I would have been here long ago. Because it really kind of sounds like it's a, it's a done deal. Um, but he urged me to come here tonight because I brought something to his attention that he apparently is not aware of. And that is how the carriage house is 
is on his property and how it impacts my green space on my property. It's actually, I mean, I'm right there on the north side, his only neighbor, and you know, I know it's, it's proposed to be four and a half feet from the line. I've taken measurements and I have pictures I've measured from the, um, from the alley. Um, but the carriage house, the bulk of it comes, takes up my whole side yard. Therefore, if I walk out, I'm going to be seeing all carriage house to my side. And it, like something's just coming right down, you know, on top of the backyard, which just ruins the ruins my ruins my property in the, in the backyard. Um, the his existing house sits so far above, or so far fr front, um, and and mine runs along right with all the other apartments as does my, my four-car garage, just like everyone else has. And Bruce McKinnon said, well, this is going to run along parallel with those garages. And I said, no, it's not. Uh, and it's not. Um, the 24-foot uh, uh, car pad that they want to put on, and, that, uh, and, and then the 26-foot, sorry, building carriage house will cover will come up in depth 80% of, of the backyard. And it's just, it's just way too close. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's just like you're boxed in. And I, I've just never known of a, any property that looks that way because it looks like you're boxed in, boxed in and someone has just built up their backyard. I, I, I can't believe that it would even be considered. Now, I'm not sure why they need the 24 inch, uh, or I'm sorry, 24 foot uh, car pad. Thank you so much, Ms. Wolf. Are there any questions or comments for Ms. Wolf? Councilmember Cinziano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to clarify, so you did not present before the commission? No. Okay. Other than speaking with him on the phone today. Okay, thank you. And he urged me to come and, and um, thank you. Mr. Perry, you have the opportunity for rebuttal. The, um, the house that's on this property, the existing house, is very small for the block. It's a single-story house, and um, most uh, most of the other buildings on the block, between Fifth Avenue and the next cross street north, are large two-story with four or more units in each building. And uh, the speaker indicated the building she's in is a four-unit building. Um, the carriage house building there. There were speakers in favor of this project at the 5th by Northwest Commission meeting. Um, apparently notice was, was received for the council meeting tonight, but uh, so I, I don't know what happened prior to that, but there were speakers in favor of this uh, project at the 5th by Northwest Commission meeting. And the, the uh, alley is narrow. It's a 16 foot right of way. And the proposed building is set in uh, by code requirements, it has to be set in four feet, and it is being set in an additional 20 feet, 24 feet total, uh, to provide for stack parking behind the detached garage. That's that's the reason for it. Um, the uh, I, it's th this was uh, enthusiastically in supported by the Fifth by Northwest Commission, and there have been many other detached carriage house proposals approved in the commission area. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Perry? Councilmember Mitchell Brown. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Perry, I'm having difficulty trying to understand. The lady saying that we're going to build this is going to extend off her, over onto her property or, or what? And you're saying that the commission said that was okay? No. Um, I, we cannot build a building on the adjacent property. This, this uh, structure has a four and a half foot 
side yard, very common side yard for the fifth by Northwest area and the urban parts of Columbus. Um, I, I think what she meant is that it is adjacent to the yard of the building to the north, but no, we are not uh, on that property at all. Okay. So as then the concern that she's expressing is not accurate or based on the way in which she described the situation or, or what? Um, the, the, the statement, uh, statement or interpretation of the building being on their property is not correct. It is adjacent to the property. So are we going to go up or are we going out? I mean, is this what you're talking about building? Uh, the building, the proposed building is uh, ground level, three car garage, and a second level apartment. The apartment uh, is uh, approximately a little under 900 square feet. It's not, not a big apartment. Um, the building is, is two story um, and is adjacent to the parcel to the north. Um, it's not, um, it is taller than a garage would be because of the apartment level. But but it is uh, this building is actually smaller than many of the buildings on the block, including the one to the north. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Perry. What, what's currently there now? Is there does your applicant have a garage or anything at all? The, yes, there is a, a small detached garage there, uh, older older frame building. Um, it's probably a two car at best. And is this going to be an expansion of that or? complete demolition? The existing garage would be removed and this would be new construction, the proposed building. And this will be constructed solely on your applicant's property? Absolutely. Solely on the applicant's property. But because of the height, it could block the property to the north view of that they currently have out of their building? Um, there, there, there may be some blockage of the yard, um, but that's not a. Um, but, but recall that, recall that an addition can be built to the house, anyway. A two-story addition can be built to the west side of the house, anyway, for the second unit. And this, this form. Uh, I mean, n number one, that addition wouldn't go through any public review process, so it would be whatever, whatever met the zoning code and building code. Um, and, and number two, um, it could be full two story, it could be two and a half story, it could be whatever. This, this um, ordinance is very specific as to the, um, what is permitted and the size and placement of it. Um, it is, it is uh, brought in from the alley to the west for the reason of the, of the relatively narrow alley. Um, virtually Virtually every building on both sides of the alley to the west um, has has garages, um, and um, it's I, I, I don't see it as being um, impactful on the property to the north. Thank you, Councilmember Hardin. Thank you, Chair Page, and, and this might have been stated, uh, Ms. Perry, but it, the reason for the 24 foot uh, set back and, um, and parking landing, because looking at, looking at it on, on, online, you can see kind of what she's talking about, where, her, where your client's house um, is further ahead and, and there's her apartment sits back. So um, I think the concern was with the proximity of the uh, carriage garage with the, her backyard. And I think that's, that's probably because of the 24 foot. Yeah. Park, like is there there was a reason I'm assuming there, there is a reason the, um, the the alley is a 16 foot right of way uh, the zoning code requires 20 feet of maneuvering area so so in this case the the detached building m must be set back a minimum of four feet to meet the four feet plus the 16 foot city right of way for the total of 20 feet in in this case the um, the property owner um, is electing to move the building in farther to provide additional parking uh, behind the detached building. Um, parking parking is a is a huge issue with the Fifth by Northwest Area Commission, and and um, by providing more on-site parking, there is um, <clears throat> more than adequate parking for the on-site uses and less parking on the street. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Thank you. I, 
would like to ask for a brief staff presentation. Good evening, members of council, President Klein, Chair Page. Uh, this request is fairly standard for a carriage house proposal in that they are, they're providing all of their parking spaces. They do have side yard variances. Uh, that is very standard. Um, this uh, property, they, it, it's three detached or three garage parking spaces, and then there is also a front driveway off of Elmwood. Uh, the, the parking that they are providing is surplus. It is not required for this development. So if they, if the applicant was willing to move the garage further to the west, they would still be able to satisfy parking. But we, we city staff is fine with the proposal either way. Thank you. Are there any questions for our staff? Seeing none. Uh, sorry, Councilmember Mitchell Brown. Okay. Thank you. Well, I am after listening to staff presentation and the applicant's um, rebuttal. I am inclined to access council and to move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Variance 1858-2017 to rezone 69 Taylor Avenue 43205 being approximately 1.3 acres located at the southwest corner of Taylor Avenue and East Long Street from P2 parking and R2F residential districts to CPD commercial plan development district. The applicant is Moody Engineering Incorporated. The proposed use is a public library and parking lots. The city department's recommendation is approval. Near East Area Commission's recommendation is approval. Are there any additional comments from staff? Is the applicant present and would like to make any additional comments? Do not believe so. I would like to move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Variance 1888-2017, to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 336301 in manufacturing districts, 3309-14A height districts, 331203D administrative requirements, 331209 owl, 331213 driveway, 331225 maneuvering, 331227 parking setback line, 331229 parking space, 331249, minimum numbers of parking spaces required. 331251, minimum number of loading spaces required. 331201, dumpster area and variances to the following sections applicable to temporary parking only. 331221, landscaping and screening. 331239, striping and marking. 331243, surface and Sorry, it's a lot of numbers here. Surface in 332103 lighting, 336324 building lines in an M manufacturing district, and variances to the urban commercial overlay sections, 3372604, setback requirements, 3372605, building design standards, 3372606, graphics, 3372607, landscaping and screening. 3372608 lighting and 3372609 parking and circulation for the property located at 732 North 4th Street 43201. To permit a mixed use development with modified development standards in the M Manufacturing District and to repeal Ordinance 3355 2016 passed January 9, 2007. Again, this is an ordinance amendment. The proposed use is to amend CV 12-06LB with setback requirements for single unit dwellings within the mixed use development. The city department's recommendation is approval. Italian Village Commission's recommendation is approval. I would like to ask for a brief staff presentation. Council members, most of you may remember this request from January of this year. We had done uh, an amendment to these exact two sub areas to tweak some of the yard standards. And uh, we are uh, back now with uh, a couple tweaks to those development standards for the, uh, for the single unit lots that are uh, coming in uh, the sub area C and D only. Uh, we, we support the re reiteration of the uh, previously approved variances into this ordinance and recognize the requested modification of development standards for detached and attached residential units established 
with the last ordinance as minor and appropriate for this mixed use project. Therefore, staff's recommendation is for approval and uh, I, I hope that we're not amending this anytime soon. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Councilmember Cinziano. Uh, thank you, Chair Page. Just quickly, since it's in the Italian Village area, uh, the Italian Village did approve for changes to the parking uh, a variance for the parking requirements? Um, they did. If there's any variances with this, it was it was basically uh, reiterating what was already approved, and this amendment did not change that. Mm -hmm. Are there any additional questions or comments? Seeing then, I would first like to move to amend to emergency. Second. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. I now move for passage as amended. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you, President Klein. That's all we have in zoning this evening. Thank you, Chair. Any other business to come before the zoning committee? Seeing none, can I get a motion to adjourn regular meeting number 40? Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. We stand adjourned on regular meeting number 40. We'll reconvene regular meeting number 39 momentarily. Regular meeting number 39. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Where we left off was in the Economic Development Committee. Uh, Chair Brown has more legislation in that committee, so Chair, the floor is back to you. Thank you, President Klein. Uh, next in Economic Development, we have Ordinance 1850-2017 to authorize the Director of Development to enter into a dual rate jobs growth incentive with Facility Source LLC for a term of up to four consecutive years in consideration of investing an estimated $1,538,000, retaining 317 full-time permanent positions and creating 272 new full-time permanent positions. Facility Source is a national facilities management company. They are proposing to expand their operations at 200 East Campus View Boulevard, which is the building the company is currently operating in. As a part of this expansion, the company is expected to enter into a six-year lease agreement for an additional 13,562 square feet on multiple floors within the building. Facility Source anticipates retaining 317 existing and creating 272 new full-time permanent positions. Those new positions with hourly wages ranging from $23 to $60 an hour. The dual rate incentive authorized in this ordinance is um, for 25% of income tax on new employees and 30% of income tax withheld on new employees who are also residents of Columbus. Are there any questions for my colleagues? Anything you want to add, Director Shoney? I move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1822 to authorize the Director of Department of Development to enter into a dual rate jobs growth incentive agreement with King Memory LLC for a term of up to five consecutive years in consideration of the company's proposed investment of $100,000 and the creation of 40 new full-time permanent positions. King Memory is a computer, hard computer hardware company that sells, recycles, and manufactures computer hardware. They're proposing to expand their headquarters and operation facility located at 380 Morrison Road. King Memory expects to retain 26 full-time and to create 40 new full-time positions with hourly wages ranging from $19 to $28 an hour with this expansion. This dual rate incentive is similar to the last one, 25 and 30 percent. Any questions from my colleagues? Anything, Director Shoney? I move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. Next, in economic development, we have Ordinance 1841-2017 to create a tax increment financing area on certain parcels of real property in the area of the White Castle headquarters to declare improvements to those parcels to be a public purpose and exempt from real property taxation and to declare an emergency. This ordinance is a part of the White Castle corporate headquarters project, which we also um, considered last week we passed an economic development agreement for this project. Under the new TIF being established by this ordinance for 555 West Goodale Street, 
any property taxes collected from the added value of this new commercial development that are also over and above the portion allocated to the schools will be diverted into a separate fund to be used for public infrastructure improvements. This is a non-school TIF. Columbus City Schools, because this is a non-school TIF, Columbus City Schools will receive the full amount of additional property tax revenue generated by the improvements to the site. Additionally, the amount of money owed by the developer is not reduced. It is diverted into the fund for the public infrastructure improvements. Are there any questions from my colleagues? Uh, Director Shoney. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, President Klein. As usual, you've done an excellent job of explaining uh, the legislation. I would just ask for your support. Thank you. I move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. And finally, in economic development, we have Ordinance 1965-2017 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development on behalf of the city to enter into a tax increment financing agreement with the White Castle Management Company to provide for the construction and financing of public infrastructure improvements within and around the tax increment financing area created by Ordinance 1841-2017 and to declare an emergency. Um, and this ordinance simply authorizes uh, the Director of Development to enter into the TIF agreement that we just established in the previous ordinance. Are there any questions from my colleagues? I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. President Klein, that's all we have in economic development, but I have one in education. May I move on? Chair, I believe there is one piece uh, that uh, we're going to let Council Member Stenziano read in economic development. Sounds good. Mr. Stenziano. Thank you, President Klein. Also in economic development, Ordinance 1967-2017 to authorize and direct the city auditor to make payments not to exceed a total of $2,305.95 in accordance with the Jobs Growth Incentive Program to Jenny's Splendid Ice Creams, LLC, to authorize and direct the city auditor to transfer an amount not to exceed $2,305.95 within the general fund to authorize and direct the city auditor to appropriate and transfer $576.49 in cash from the Special Income Tax Fund to the General Fund to authorize the expenditure not to exceed of $2,305.95 from the General Fund and declare an emergency. For tax year 2016, the City of Columbus had a total of 26 active and reporting job growth incentive projects. One of these projects is Jenny's Splendid Ice Creams, which is addressed in this legislation. The other 25 were addressed tonight previously on Ordinance 1732-2017. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage Second. by voice. Ms. Brown? Mr. Brown? Yes. Hardin? Yes. Page? Yes. Stinziano? Yes. Tyson? Yes. President Klein? Um, tonight we have one piece in education, Ordinance 1190-2017 to authorize and direct the Director of Education to enter into contracts with high-quality pre-kindergarten organizations to provide educational services, to waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code, to authorize the expenditure of up to $4,200,000 from the general fund, and to declare an emergency. This ordinance represents a major component of the city's Early Start Columbus initiative. The purpose of Early Start Columbus is to expand high-quality pre-kindergarten services through partnerships with Columbus City Schools and community-based providers. The providers we are working with have all demonstrated their ability to deliver a high-quality pre-kindergarten education and are rated at least three stars in the state's Step Up to Quality rating and improvement system. These funds will be strategically combined with funding from state sources to extend its impact by efficiently increasing the number of children served. I want to thank Mayor Ginther and Director Rhonda Johnson for their continued focus on the important goal of making high-quality pre-K education available to all Columbus children. Research shows that children who participate in high-quality pre-kindergarten experience significantly improve High quality pre-kindergarten experiences significantly improve their early literacy, language, and math skills, and have improved education outcomes throughout their time in school. I want to again thank you, Director Johnson, um, for your tireless work on this effort um, day in and day out. 
Uh, is there anything you'd like to add about the process this year and the providers we're working with? Thank you, Chair Brown, President Klein, members of council. As you know, the, the mayor's goal is universal access for pre-K for all four-year-olds living in the city. This ordinance represents the fourth year of Early Start Columbus. And even though we're, we're asking waive, uh, waiver of the competitive bid process, we were able to grant uh, awards to all providers who applied for funding um, of those who had that qualified and had at least three stars. Uh, school is going to be starting for our kids on um, April the 23rd, so we really appreciate uh, your passing um, this legislation. Thank you, Director Johnson. I also wanna highlight the work that the department is doing under your leadership to help get more of our providers onto the step up to quality system. It's absolutely critical um, with the state's imperative that anyone receiving publicly funded childcare dollars has to be step up to quality rated by 2020. That year is approaching soon, so thank you very much. Any questions from my colleagues or comments? Um, again, Chairwoman Brown, I just want to say thank you for your leadership in this regard and also to Director Johnson. Uh, this is such an important piece of legislation because it really, as I said last week, it just prepares our kids to be able um, to go to school prepared. And when they go to school prepared, they're gonna have so much more success in terms of you know, finishing elementary, passing middle school, getting through high school. And it is critically important based upon what I'm thinking about our workforce. This is our future workforce mm -hmm. and just, um, Again, thank you for your leadership. Thank, doc thank you to Dr. Johnson. Thank you to the administration. Um, <clears throat> but I certainly can, don't want to minimize the importance of this for the future of our city. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, uh, Pro Tem Tyson. And that's right. In many ways, this is an economic development investment. Hearing no further comment or questions, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin Page, Stinziano Tyson, President Klein. That's all I have in my committees, President Klein. Thank you, Chair. The next committee is Public Service and Transportation. It's chaired by Council Member Hardin. Chair Hardin, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Klein. This evening in Public Service and Transportation, we have Ordinance 1423-2017 to amend the 2017 Capital Improvement Budget to authorize the appropriation of $3,551,188.16 from the various grant and TIF funds to transfer funds between projects to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into construction guaranteed maximum reimbursement agreement with Hamilton Crossing LLC to construct public infrastructure projects in the area of North Hamilton Road and State Route 161 to authorize the expenditure of $6,204,954.82 from the various grants, bonds, and TIF fund and to authorize and declare an emergency. Uh, the city will be reimbursed for half of this capital improvement through future tax increment financing revenue. This is, again, for the infrastructure improvements uh, in the Hamilton and 161 area. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1774-2017 to amend the 2017 Capital Improvement Budget to appropriate funds within the Streets and Highways Improvement Non-Bond Fund to authorize the City Auditor to transfer funds and appropriation within the Streets and Highways Bond Fund to authorize the City Auditor to transfer funds and appropriation within the Streets and Highways Improvement Non-Bond Fund to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into contract with Nicholas M. Safco and Sons and to provide for the payment of construction, construction administration, and inspection services in connection with the Arena West Nationwide Boulevard project to authorize the expenditure of up to, of up to $4,626,755.53 relative to this project and to declare an emergency. This project will construct part of Nationwide Boulevard and includes drainage, traffic control, street lighting, and landscaping improvements. The costs are split with $2 million from the Department of Public Service and $2.6 million from NRI uh, Equity Land Investments, Inc. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank, 
Thank you. Next, I have Ordinance 1839-2017 to authorize an amendment of the 2017 capital improvement budget to authorize the transfer of funds between projects within, within the Streets and Highways Bond Fund to authorize the transfer of funds between the projects within the Storm Sewer Bonds Fund, to authorize the Director of the Public Service to enter into contract with Columbus Asphalt Paving, Inc. in connection with the Pedestrian Safety Improvement Fairwood Avenue Wayland to Watkins Project, to authorize expenditure of up to $539,666.88 for Pedestrian Safety Improvements Fairwood Avenue Wayland to Watkins Project, and to authorize the expenditure of up to Three, uh, $325,750.15 from the Storm Sewer Bond Fund for the Fairwood Avenue sidewalk from Wayland to Watkins Storm Sewer Improvement Project and to declare an emergency. I'm extremely excited about this piece of legislation. We're installing sidewalks on the east side of Fairwood Avenue from Wayland Drive to Watkins Road. This stretch is on the far south side of Columbus and it's more than um, half a mile uh, and is right next to Southfield Missionary Baptist Church and so I appreciate all the community members and folks who um, have worked with us and have labored patiently with us uh, to get us thus far um, and if there are no question or comments I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. Next, I have Ordinance 1843-2017 to amend the 2017 Capital Improvement Budget to authorize the City Auditor to transfer cash and appropriation between projects within the Streets and Highways Bonds Fund, to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into construction guarantee maximum reimbursement agreement with Alford Inc., and to encumber funds to pay for the City to perform construction administration and inspection services for a combined total amount of $1 $364,451.45 for the NCR Wyland Park 5th, or 7th through 9th project and to authorize expenditure of $1,364,451.45 uh, from the Streets and Highway Bond Fund and to, and to declare an emergency. The city is undertaking the Wyland Park Capital Improvement Project, which will make streetscapes improvements from uh, along North High Street from 7th to 9th Avenue. Uh, if there are no questions or comments. I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. Next, I have Ordinance 1853-2017 to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into contract with Strasser Paving Company in connection with the resurfacing program to authorize and direct the City Auditor to appropriate and transfer funds from the Special Income Tax Fund to Streets and Highways Bonds Fund to appropriate funds within the Streets and Highways Bond Fund and to authorize expenditure of $7,822,539.23 from the Streets and Highways Bonds Fund and to declare an emergency. This contract consists of repairing and resurfacing 42 city streets and, and constructing 415 ADA curb ramps along those streets. The work consists of milling the existing pavement, overlaying with uh, new asphalt concrete, and replacing curb and sidewalks associated with installing ADA wheelchair ramps. This is a great project, one of our, I think, three um, uh, streets and sidewalks uh, projects for the year. Um, and so I uh, encourage or ask my colleagues uh, for their support, and I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. Next, I have Ordinance 1865-2017 to amend the 2017 Capital Improvement Budget to appropriate funds within the Streets and Highway Improvement Non-Bond Fund to authorize the City Auditor to transfer your funds and appropriation within the Streets and Highway Improvement Non-Bond Fund to waive the competitive bidding requirements of Columbus City Code to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into contract with G&G Cement Contractors and Petruzzi Concrete Design to provide for the payment of construction administration and inspection services in connection with the sidewalk rescue program and to authorize the expenditure of up to $73,000 from the Streets and Highway Improvement Non-Bond Fund and a declared emergency. 
Prior to last year, if a, prior, if a property owner was cited for poor conditions of their sidewalk, that property owner was responsible for the full cost of fixing their sidewalks. Sidewalks can be ex extremely expensive, and the median sidewalk repair for a cost of a homeowner is around $1,500. For low or income uh, co uh, community members, this could be a major financial imposition. Last year, Councilmember Cenziano and I implemented the Sidewalk Rescue, uh, Rescue Program to help low income property owners uh, and small businesses in our NCR districts pay for sidewalk repairs. This legislation contracts with G and G Concrete and Petruzzi uh, Concrete Design for the repair of said sidewalks. Council requested that, that Columbus small businesses make repairs to sidewalk rescue properties. The Department of Public Service used the United States Small Business Administration definition of a small business to identify potential businesses for this contract. Uh, the state's EDGE website, along with the city's Office of Diversity and Inclusion, were both consulted to locate potential small businesses within the city for this work. Ten companies were found. Um, to, uh, 10 companies were found uh, that could do this work, and uh, all 10 companies were contacted and expressed interest. GNG Cement con Contractors and Petruzzi Concrete Design responded to requests for, uh, for pricing. A bid waiver is requested to allow the Department of Public Service to enter into contract with these two small businesses, both of which are located here in Columbus. Uh, if there are no questions or comments, again, thank you to Councilmember Cenziano uh, for um, putting your uh, allocated uh, set aside dollars into this program last year. I think it's another really good program for the community. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. Next, I have 1899-2017 to authorize the appropriation of $300,000 in the USDOT Grant Smart City Fund to authorize the Director of Public Service to execute a not-for-profit service contract with Battelle Memorial Institute for services related to the Smart Cities Challenge to authorize expenditure of up to $300,000 to pay for services and to declare an emergency. I see uh, Ms. Brandy Braun is here from the Smart City Columbus, and I'd ask her to come and just give just a little background on this um, before I ask my colleagues to move for passage. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Braun, for uh, being at council this evening. Thank you, Chair Hardin. Thank you, President Klein and members of council. We are requesting to enter into contract with Battelle Memorial Institute to assist with the planning and implementation of part of our U.S. Department of Transportation Smart City Challenge Grant. That challenge grant comprises, is comprised of 15 different projects, and so Battelle will be helping us develop safety management plans for each one of those projects. More specifically, one of those projects is to create and test a connected vehicle environment, uh, which is cutting edge new technology that is changing every day. Battelle has significant experience in working with USDOT on connected vehicle environments, so they will be serving in an advisor role in helping us through the process. I would also add that Battelle was a significant contributor as part of our application process, and their fees are greatly reduced as part of their partnership with us. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Um, seeing none, um, I move for passage. Thank you, Ms. Braun. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. That is all I have in my committees this evening. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Chair Hardin. The next committee is Recreation and Parks. It's chaired by Councilmember Page. Chair Page, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Klein. This evening in Recreation and Parks, we have Ordinance 1752-2017 to authorize and direct the Director of Recreation and Parks to enter into various contracts for the provision of pre-admission screening system providing options and resources today, which is known as our passport program that helps our aging residents to stay in their home while they're aging. And this will authorize the expenditure of $50 million from the Recreation and Parks Grant Fund and to declare an emergency. I am co-sponsoring this legislation with Councilmember Michael Cinziano. And if there are no further questions or comments, I move for passage by voice. Second. Ms. Brown? Mr. Brown? Yes. Hardin? Yes. Page? Yes. Stinziano? Yes. Tyson? President Klein? Yes. Thank you. That's all we have in Recreation and Parks this evening. Thank you, Chair Page. The next committee is Public Utilities. It's chaired by Councilmember Stenziano. Chair, the floor is yours. Tonight in Public Utilities, bring forth Ordinance 
1837-2017 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to negotiate and enter into a contract for purchase power to weigh provisions of Columbus City Code relating to award of contracts through the request for proposals process to authorize the expenditure of $1 from the Electricity Operating Fund and to declare an emergency. Uh, this legislation authorizes the Director of Public Utilities to negotiate with multiple potential providers of purchase power to enter into a contract for purchase power and waives provisions of the code relating to the award of contracts through the RFP process. Negotiating contract terms and power pricing with more than one provider should allow the city to secure the best contract available. It's in our customers' best interest to obtain stable prices in advance, and it may be beneficial to secure power for this period at this time. Wholesale electric prices are currently driven in large measures by the price for natural gas, which is often the fuel used to generate power by the generators setting price in the PGAM market. Presently, low natural gas prices and record levels of natural gas and storage have pushed the market down over recent months, resulting in favorable market conditions for procuring additional electric generation supply. This ordinance is requested to be an emergency measure to allow contract negotiations to begin at the earliest possible date. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. And the final ordinance I have is 1856-2017. To authorize the Director of Public Utilities to modify and increase an existing professional engineering agreement with Arcadis U.S. for the Southerly Wastewater Treatment Plant Chemically Enhanced Primary Treatment Clarification. To authorize the appropriation and transfer of funds from the Sanitary Sewer Reserve Fund to the Sanitary Sewer General Obligation Bond Fund, and to authorize the expenditure of $3,308,518 from the Sanitary Sewer General Obligation Bond Fund and to declare an emergency. This project is one of three projects to provide the chemically enhanced primary treatment at the Southerly Wastewater Treatment Plant as approved by the Ohio EPA. Again, the Southerly Wastewater Treatment Plant facilities, facilities provides additional plant capacity to treat wet water weather flows in excess of 300 million gallons per day, and it will focus on upgrades and modifications to provide a new clarifers, sludge handling facilities, and chemical feed facilities. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. The legislation passes. Thank you, President Klein. The next committee is the Rules and Reference Committee. I chair that committee. We have one piece on tonight. It's 1868-2017 to submit the electors of the City of Columbus at a special election to be held concurrently with the regular general election on November 7, 2017, the question of amending the Charter of the City of Columbus, such question to be known as, quote, Proposed Charter Amendment Number 1, City Council, unquote. I'd first like to remove this from the table. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. It's taken from the table. I'd like to turn it over to Shannon Harden. Thank you, Council President. Uh, over the past year, our city has asked ourselves itself, how can we reform uh, Columbus City Council so it is as responsive and as accountable and transparent as possible? A bipartisan citizen-run committee led this conversation. Holding meetings all across Columbus, they reviewed council structure, size, and operations. Based on governing best practices and community input, the committee put together a set of recommendations. The recommendations, if approved by the voters, would increase the number of council members from seven to nine, transition council from an at-large system to an at-large by place system, and require council to hold at least one public hearing during the vacancy appointment process. Since receiving these recommendations, council members have held public hearings and community conversations. In both the structured conversations and in ca casual inter interactions, community, community leaders have expressed concerns. Some say no change is needed. Others would like to increase the number of council members without the structural change or vice versa. The Charter Review Committee put these recommendations forward as a package. However, at this time, there's not enough community consensus on these items to, in, to, in totality. Tonight, we'll table the proposal indefinitely. I asked uh, my council colleagues to table indefinitely, uh, providing us more time uh, to gather more community feedback and vet the proposed changes. Uh, we'll meet, I'll meet with my colleagues over August recess and we'll decide on how best to solicit additional uh, feedback. We will continue to look at how to modernize council and how to best serve um, the people of Columbus. We should never shy away from discussing how we govern ourselves. And this is too important of a discussion to rush. Um, I, along with my colleagues, will continue to push 
push for inclusive dialogue and work towards a system where everyone feels heard and represented. I appreciate, again, thank you to my colleagues for allowing me to be, uh, to be a part of this conversation. Um, and thank you for your support. And um, I uh, move to table the ordinance 1867, 1868, 2017. I'd like to open the floor to my colleagues that want to maybe speak on this ordinance. Seeing no comment, I'd, I would like uh, to thank the Charter Review Committee uh, that held numerous meetings in the public, solicited public testimony uh, to get us to this point. Uh, I think that your leadership, Councilmember Hardin, uh, has been steadfast, and I applaud it, uh, as well as uh, your recommendation to table it indefinitely to further the conversation on this topic because of how important it is to the community. So we do have speaker slips that we will take. Uh, we, will, we will honor, uh, despite the fact that we are tabling it indefinitely. There's been a motion to table indefinitely. Is there a second? Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. So the motion carries, will be tabled indefinitely. And our first speaker is Joe Motiel. Joe Motil, reside at 167 West Cook Road in Columbus, Ohio. <clears throat> President Klein, members of City Council, Chair Harden. When, this, when the process and talk of looking into a possible change into the makeup of City Council began in July of last year during the campaign of Issue 1, Councilman Harden stated, and I quote, community input will be at the crux of this process as we look at the current vacancy appointment process, the number of council members, wards, and numerous other potential changes, end quote. Well, it was quite obvious from what was proposed that the crux of community input was completely disregarded. Now, one piece of truly evidence-based district at-large forms of city governments were considered. And let's be honest, the outcome of this proposal was determined well before any public hearings in this attempt to lead the people of the city into believing that their testimony and comments would be considered as a part of such a charter amendment is being completely dishonest. And to continue to use the defeat of issue one as an argument, to justify the existence of an at-large city council is ludicrous. The loss of that election came by $1.1 million in contributions to the One Columbus Campaign Committee that was comprised of tax abatement recipients, developers, law firms, construction-related businesses, and major corporations, all of whom donate heavily to each and every one of your campaigns. The committee was created to fund the dissemination of lies and to protect the financial interest of those contributors in order to squash any possible dismantling or of a pay-to-play system of government that has been in place for quite some time and this current city council continues to sanction. The proposed charter amendment is nothing short of an extension of two members of the current at-large makeup of the city council that will only add two more council members to rubber stamp legislation, grant tax abatements to their friendly campaign contributing developers and billion dollar corporations and continue pouring millions of our city's tax dollars into our downtown short north in the arena district while our older established neighborhoods and its citizens continue to be neglected and ignored. If this ill-advised proposal is approved and thankfully it wasn't and that it will be tabled indefinitely, it would most certainly become a subject of a lawsuit dear to its clear violation of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 as amended in 1982 which is established to eliminate such illegal solely at-large systems that discriminate on the basis of race and color due to the dilution of their voting power with the majority of white voters in Columbus. Unless the city council can put together a fair and impartial commission that truly has the best interest of the citizens of Columbus at heart is without any political influence and instruction from its elected officials and puts forth recommendations that are not in conflict with the Voting Rights Act the city will never be at peace and have a true and favorable democracy that serves all walks of life. Thank you. Any questions or comments for Mr. O'Teal? Okay. Our next speaker is Jonathan Beard. Mr. Beard, if you just state your name, your address, any organizations you represent, you'll have three minutes. Good evening, I'm John Beard with Everyday People for Positive Change. We're a ballot issue committee that's been working on this issue for some time. Um, 
I don't even know where to start with this. I guess it's good that you table it and you're not trying to vote this and, and have voters vote on this terrible proposal today. It's bad that you're not just voting it down. This was a trash proposal, okay? I agree with everything Joe said. It was not an honest attempt to create a, a, a good form of government. You look at the, how the committee was selected, the members selected, um, uh, where they came from, what their backgrounds were, and it was clear. You look at the fact that they were led and steered by city staff members, including the person who led the campaign against issue one that told all those lies, like the fact that, like, like the lie that he told that, you know, issue one would create $80,000 a year part-time jobs when issue one did nothing with council salaries and did nothing with council's current part-time salary. So you put this person in front of the committee and he lied and steered and misguided them. And you came up with this terrible proposal that is supposed to be best practice. That was the charge, right? The charge was to bring back best practice. Is that right, Mr. Harney? So you came back with this proposal that is practiced nowhere else in no big cities. They give three cities as comparables, Reno, Nevada, Sparks, Nevada, and Tucson, Arizona. The biggest one is 60% of Columbus's size. And that one two years ago had a lawsuit against, um, against their, the system, which is not actually, actually the same exact system that they're proposed here. There was a lawsuit against it. The lawsuit was upheld in the trial court, overturned on appeal. Now you've got the Nevada State Legislature, which is rewriting the Reno Charter right now, passed out of both House and Senate committees to rewrite the charter to get rid of this monstrosity, which is practiced nowhere else in America. So how is this considered a best practice? It's, it's one of those things where you got a committee recommendation that came to you, but it's one of those things where it's garbage in, garbage out. And, and so you're looking at garbage now, and the correct thing to do is to throw it out. Not to table it, but to throw it out. You could look at the same information that was presented to this committee, and if it had been tr treated fairly, if it had been looked at by city staff in an unbiased manner, if it had been presented by city staff in an unbiased manner, they would have come back with something very different. We had um, State Representative um, Bill Shuck, who on two occasions came to this committee and provided testimony that said the average city council size for uh, cities between 700,000 and a million in population is either 11 members or 13 members. So they came up with this nine member council. And if you watch, the, if you watch the, how they did it on council, I mean, they, on, on, on YouTube, they were throwing out things and, and changing, well, it wasn't this, it wasn't that, and, and trying to fix the numbers to fit what they preordained, okay? If you look at the fact that council, that there was a lot of testimony about this vacancy, the appointment of members to the vacant um, positions right now. They did next to nothing to deal with it, okay? They looked at options and they came back with a recommendation that did nothing. Um, you look at campaign finance, they did nothing on that. So citizens are now putting together a proposal and we'll be submitting it for another ballot initiative. Uh, we'll get it on the ballot and we're gonna look at all these things. We're gonna do it the right way. We're gonna do it the way all the testimony that came in, we looked at that, we evaluated that, we took the time, we put it together, it'll be on the ballot in, in, for the primary ballot is our goal. Council could actually just put it on the ballot right now. Um, you know, five votes would put it on the ballot. You're not gonna do that. Um, you know, if, if, we, if we get it in, we may have to do a special election that would cost the city a million dollars. The, the wise thing to do is just council put it on the ballot. It's tried, it's tested. It's real best practice, and it's not the trash that you're considering now. I'm glad you tabled it. Um, you Beard, can do better. And to, the fact that nobody has brought up Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act just means this council has sold out its black citizens. Thank you. Any questions or comments for Mr. Beard? Seeing none, our next speaker is Willis Brown. Mr. Brown, if you could state your name and the organizations you represent, your address, and you'll have three yes, minutes. Yes, Willis Brown, president of the Bronzeville Neighborhood Association, council members, and President Klein. Um, you know, I'm glad that you did table it, and definitely it should be thrown out. But here's the deal. We spent a lot of time, and even today, when we read it in the dispatch, you know, we had over 60 people that were going to come down here to show. I, you like seeing people. So when we saw that in the dispatch, we had to call them and say, you know what? You know, we just go down there and let them know that we are not giving up. So, uh, you know, we, we fought it last year. We're coming in again. The only way you're going to have good government is to give up control. And by doing that, you gain control. You know, I can't understand how logically the, the committee can say nine seats and you can still be voted at large. I mean, that's almost ridiculous. How is that representation? And if you look at history, Oliver Cromwell, you know, fought King George to say, look, the people want representation. He was like y'all, some of y'all, saying, hey, we want to control. We want to keep you there. What happened to George? He lost his head. 
because he didn't give and had the, the formation of the house of, of the common folk. Don't let that be the case here because we're not going to stop. We are the people. You are elected. You are given the authority to administer the governance on us as citizens. But we, the citizens, have absolute power. I mean, it's just what this country was built on. But y'all keep fighting us. You know how much time we spent on all of this? And we're not going to lose. That's not going to happen. If that was the case, we would, we would all be under the British crown today. It is in our bloods as Americans to fight the administration when it's not representing us to its true form. So how can you win? It's impossible. It is not in the American fabric for you to win over us, the people. You can't. We are not dumb. We've all been educated, from Ivy Leagues to private colleges. So we are just as smart as you are, and collectively more powerful than you are. And we are showing that. We put our time, our money, and our effort to make this a better government. You cannot seven manage a million people. It's impossible to be effective. We are saying, let us come into the picture and give direction. If they had done that, one, you wouldn't have King George losing his head, and two, if the British had given and listened to, uh, you know, Benjamin Franklin and, and all our, the framers of this country, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have lost this country. But they didn't listen. And you're doing the same thing. Maybe, you know, we say in science, genes will bounce around, but they don't break down. So maybe some of y'all have those old genes from England that's keeping you, you know, from being free to, to listen to the new stuff. We need to live and get to be the true Americans, meaning open to everything and trying something that works for everyone. What this system had, it was not good when it was first created. It is no longer any good. So let us come and give you direction so you can do the right thing. And I'm not Spike Lee, but do the right thing in this government so we can be productive. Thank you. Any questions or comments for Mr. Brown? That's our final speaker on this subject. We do have some non-agenda speakers. Can I get a motion to adjourn regular meeting number 39? So moved. Has it been seconded? Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. We stand adjourned, and we'll take non-agenda speakers momentarily. <laughs>